hello, my friends, and welcome to the Seeds and Weeds podcast, brought to you by Small House Farm. If you're looking to celebrate plants and the people that love them, then this is the podcast for you. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. We have got a great one lined up for you today. We're going to be hanging out with the amazing Brie Arthur, and she's going to be answering five questions for us today. Now, if you don't know Brie, you better pay attention. She is an amazing gardener and educator. She is the super popular uh, Brie the Plant Lady YouTube channel, and she's the author of two great books, The Foodscape Revolution and Gardening with Grains. Brie is awesome. We had a really fun time recording this interview. After we chat with Brie, we're going to be uh, doing something a little different. We're going to be sitting down with Annie Toro Lopez for a game of chili pepper trivia. Now, Annie owns High Prairie Press, and they recently published a super fun green chili cookbook called Warfano's Happy Heart. So we're going to be quizzing Annie on her knowledge of that spicy little chili pepper. I thought this would be a perfect segment after our last episode where we did uh, the top five peppers for your garden. So make sure you stick around for some chili pepper trivia. In just a few weeks, it's going to finally be the first day of spring, and we're already starting to organize our seasonal gift baskets that we send out to our Patreon supporters. Each solstice at Equinox, we mail out a bundle of handcrafts crafted seasonal goodies. I'm talking herbal teas, tinctures, artwork, seeds, oil blends, all sorts of groovy stuff. And there's still time to sign up. You can find the link to our Patreon on our website, seedsandweedspodcast.com or at patreon.com slash smallhousefarm. And thanks again to those of you that have made the choice to support the podcast. We wouldn't be able to do this show without you. All right, let's get on to the interview. Known for her leadership with the National Foodscape Movement and her lively, information-packed presentations, Brie Arthur is a celebrated speaker and best-selling author. With two decades of experience as a professional horticulturist, propagator, and communicator, Brie shares her expertise with audiences around the country. And she's a correspondent on the Emmy Award-winning PBS television show, Growing a Greener World. Today, Brie's going to be joining us for five questions. Brie, my friend, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. It's such a treat to be here. Now, you're gardening down in North Carolina, but I know that you travel all over the place. And we actually first met here in Michigan. Um, What was it like? Early 2020, I think. I think you're right. It was before the world changed. And, you know, I'm a native Michigander. I grew up in Monroe. So I love when I get invited to visit, you know, my home state. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I love those events too. The one that we went to together, um, it was a nice sized event. It had a good crowd. And my favorite thing about those types of events is meeting folks like you, all these like-minded people and we get together. And sometimes some of these folks that you meet get to become friends. And I think that's pretty groovy. I agree. I mean, I I saw you and I was like, he has to become my friend. Absolutely. Now, the segment that we're going to do today is called Five Questions. So I've just got five questions for you. But before we get into the interview, um, how about you tell our listeners just a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do. Well, um, I, as I mentioned, I grew up in southeastern Michigan, and it was because of 4-H that I discovered my love of horticulture. Um, in fact, I learned my first botanical Latin entering Econops Retro into the Monroe County Fair. So my love affair with horticulture started young, and I studied landscape design at Purdue and actually moved to North Carolina. It'll be 21 years ago in May. Wow. And the first half of my career, I was uh, really devoted to ornamental nursery production. I worked as a propagator and grower um, at Plant Delights Nursery in Camellia Forest. And about 10 years ago, my hobby as a home gardener kind of overtook my career in the nursery industry. And I had the opportunity to join Growing a Greener World TV on PBS with Joe Lample and basically start showing people how I garden at home, integrating vegetables in my HOA approved ornamental landscape. And I wrote a couple books and and have kind of been swept away on the lecture circuit ever since. Oh, I love it. I love it. I also love the way that you garden, like you said, within the restrictions of the HOA, you are able to grow still practically anything that you want um, within those restrictions, and it doesn't seem to hold you back at all. Well, and that's the thing I really aim to show is there's so many people living in suburban developments with a lot of strict covenants about your landscaping. And I don't want that to be a deterrent for people to learn and love gardening, I I want to instruct people on how they can use that to their advantage. 
manage. And, you know, I would love to live in a world where homeowner associations didn't dictate what you were allowed to do. But the bottom line is it's what we have and I'm going to try and work with it instead of against it. You got to make the best of it. Absolutely. All right. So here's our first question. If you had to pick a favorite plant or plant family, what would it be and why? (laughs) I love this question. All right. I have called myself the crazy green lady for quite a long time now. So hands down, my favorite plant family is the Poaceae or grass family. And it's primarily because humanity can't exist without it. You know, our entire species has evolved as a result of our focusing on selecting and breeding plants in the Poaceae family, specifically edible grains, both for human consumption and animal consumption. And it's really at the heart and soul of community development over many, many centuries. And I I just think it's a a category of plants that because of turf generally gets underappreciated. And, you know, I mean, let's face it, we do a lot of bad things to maintain grass, like specifically grass surrounding our houses. We put a lot of chemicals down and a lot of our worst plant practices come from that. And In contrast, we couldn't exist without those plants in that family. Right. And we're talking things like corn and wheat and barley, all the important stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's at the heart and soul of what we eat and drink. And drink. That's an important detail. All right. Question number two for you then. What is your most recent garden success? Ooh, well, I'm going to hopefully count this as a success. I have literally just broken ground on a brand new all natives garden. So we bought the house next door and we're running it as an Airbnb. And my goal with the property was to expand my plant palette. Admittedly, I'm an expert in growing Asian native trees and shrubs. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to grow plants that I'm less familiar with. So I decided to dive in headfirst with all North American natives, but very specifically Southeastern natives, um, so that I would create a better place for habitat, lower maintenance, um, and really use it as an instructional experience for everyone. Um, And also to create a garden that doesn't look messy Traditionally, a lot of native gardens have gotten the bad reputation of looking overgrown or not, or just not managed well. And my aim with this is to prove that wrong. So it's brand new. So I'm not sure I can count it as a success yet, but I'm very hopeful. Fingers crossed, right? Yeah. (laughs) All right. So here's the flip question then. What's your most recent garden failure or more specifically, what is the lesson that you learned from a recent garden failure? Well, I'm just going to say the word to tomatoes <laughs> in hopes that other people will feel my pain. I am obsessed with tomatoes. I love I love eating tomatoes. I love canning tomatoes. They're a huge part of my diet. Uh, tomatoes are increasingly difficult. Specifically for me here in North Carolina, I garden on a former tobacco field and the disease and insect pressure that's building up as a result of that past land use, very specifically root knot nematodes, which aren't an issue issue that impacts everyone. It's a huge problem for people in my region. We have sandy soil that gets very hot. And by August, September, October, the nematodes just decimate the root system of, of tomato plants. So I'm constantly trying new things with tomatoes. And really now my focus is trying to change my planting time. So I'm trying to learn almost more like people in Texas do, where you do an early season and then you take the summers off and you do a fall season. But, I, you know, tomatoes are my constant challenge, but I love them too much to give up. I hear you. I hear you. And I wish you the best of luck with that. But at the same time, the fact that you could have an early season and a late season of tomatoes, um, being someone here in Michigan, that makes me crazy jealous for sure. Yes. I, I don't mean to rub it in. But, <laughs> you know, there's, there's not all the advantages of living in the South. We have a really difficult winter season where we're like 70 degrees and then 11 degrees within 24 hours. It makes it really hard for overwintering plants. So the one advantage we do have is like a nine month frost free season. I got to lean into that. Yeah, you do. That's incredible. But, you know, like you said, every place uh, wherever you're at has its own benefits and challenges. And that's kind of the beauty of gardening is learning the area that we're in and how to make the most of what we have. Okay, question number four. What is a current?
current project that you're working on that you're very excited about? Well, golly, I feel like I just answered this with my giant native installation. You did. So now you got to give us another one. Another one. Okay. Well, so another one is my obsession with ground plane coverage and doing that by direct seating. And I basically have decided I don't want to ever have to buy mulch again. Okay. I don't enjoy mulching. And of course, I love using leaves, but I'm trying to figure out a dynamic where I can engage the ground plane in a meaningful way with beautiful plants that I can also eat that will also improve the soil. It's kind of trying to blur the lines with cover cropping and cottage gardening and coming up with seed grown mixes that, you know, perform really well. And it's definitely something that I spend an, an abnormal amount of time thinking about. It definitely proves that I'm not well adjusted because I think about seeds 99% of my waking hours. You know, that's probably why we get along so well, Brie. I know it is. Like when I heard you speak, I was like, oh my gosh, we're horticultural soulmates. One thing that I've been into lately, um, speaking of kind of ground cover is um, creeping thyme. I'd gotten some from a local greenhouse, just like a mat, this little thyme plant that grows all over the place. And it's a little slow growing. So it'll probably be a while before I could use it as a living mulch. But I'm, I'm really intrigued by the potential that this plant has for just the same thing that you're talking about, I think. That's exactly it. I'm digging it. I'm digging it. Okay, here's the last question for you then. So what is a project that you're not personally involved in, but you're still really excited about? So uh, who's your shout out today? Okay, my shout out goes to Preston Montague, who is a super talented horticulturalist, naturalist, and actually certified landscape architect, which are three things that you rarely hear in one sentence. And he is really focused on designing landscapes to support birds in many different forms, habitat, food source, to facilitate migratory birds and local birds. And I really think that it's something that everybody should be paying attention to because, you know, just like grains, humanity can't exist without birds. And we've done a lot of bad things agriculturally that impact the bird population, but we can improve that through our design choices, both residential and commercial. And I love that he's leading the way. That is very cool. I dig that for sure. I'm going to put his link down in the show notes as well so folks can follow up with him because that that's really, really cool stuff right there. And that's five questions with Bree Arthur. Now, Bree, where can people find you to connect with you online? What are your links? My website is breegrows.com. That's Bree like the cheese, B-R-I-E-G-R-O-W-S.com. But I am also on YouTube every single day at Brie the Plant Lady. That's awesome. Brie the Plant Lady. Brie like the cheese. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Oh, thank you so much. This has been a sincere pleasure. And I always have a good time chatting with Brie. She and I are actually scheduled to uh, be at the West Michigan Home and Garden Show this weekend in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm going to be headlining the Garden to Table stage on Friday and Saturday. And Brie's going to be speaking about foodscaping with perennials and sizzling succulents over on the Proven Winners Garden Stage. It looks like it's going to be a pretty cool event, and I'm pretty stoked to be a part of it. Plus... It's going to be fun hanging out with Bree and a bunch of uh, other garden nerds, too. Speaking of garden nerds, I think it's time to talk with Annie Lopez about chili peppers. Like I mentioned earlier, Annie's the owner of High Prairie Press. She's also an author, a food culture enthusiast, and a passionate seed saver. Let's see how well she does at Chili Pepper Trivia. Annie, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us today. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you, Bevan. I'm so excited to be here. I look forward to having the opportunity to chat with you. So today I want to talk to you about your new book, Warfano's Happy Heart, favorite green chili recipes and more that was just recently released through your publishing company, High Prairie Press. But before we get into that, could you tell us all just a little bit more about who you are and the work that you do? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. So I, um, my name is Annie Toro Lopez and I am an author and a publisher and also a seed saver. Something that I got into actually as I was teaching, I was an eighth grade teacher and I would take my students to Washington, D.C. every year. And part of what we did is we would go to Mount Vernon, which is the home of George Washington, and their docents would have a seed sale. And the first time I brought seeds home from that garden, from this historic garden, and planted them in my own garden was just transformational. And I fell in love. So I started collecting seeds from, oh, from Van Gogh's garden and from Shakespeare's garden and from George. Keith's garden and being a teacher I started 
going out and, and teaching about seed preservation and um, my love for food and my love for literature and the written language um, kind of all came together in this beautiful, magical way. And um, we created the Warfano's Happy Heart Cookbook. The green chili in Colorado is iconic. And my husband is, is a Native American and it's very much a part of his culture in New, from the New Mexico and Southern Colorado. And every fall, the, the roasters come out and the chilies are roasted and the smell of uh, roasted chilies if you know it's just heaven and so it's it's a it's a way of life here it's a fall way of life here and so this cookbook was an attempt to capture that that is fantastic now this new cookbook Warfano's Happy Heart I just gotta say right off the top I love this book Annie it is super fun I mean not only does it have these recipes with the green chilies but there's like these stories they're weaved throughout the pages it is a fantastic read but my first question is who is Warfano what is the meaning behind the title of the book, Warfano's Happy Heart. So the um, Warfano is the um, name of the county that we created the book in. After the um, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the border of Mexico shifted north, but the people didn't move. And so a lot of the people there, including my, my husband's family, is native to this area back for, you know, countless generations. And they're still there. And the green chili is a plant that came up through the Aztecs and migrated north. And that story is in the book and has just is such an iconic part of of the culture there. It's in the heart of the culture. And that's what we were trying to capture is that part of the country that is still very, very native and very deep roots there. I love that. That's super cool. Now, like you mentioned, there's a number of different people who have contributed the recipes and the different stories throughout the book. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the people and how they got involved in the project? Yeah. So we had um, that first recipe, the the green chili recipe, and then the green the green chili story. Um, Meredith contributed, and what an amazing person she is. She's also a beautiful writer, and and also it was fun to be able to have our own green chili recipe in there. That you know, my husband, his family, you know, he grew up. We always talk about you know there was always a pot of green chili on the back of the stove. At the first time when I met my husband, and we went to the chili roasting and we bought like a bushel of chilies right and we're like we're gonna put up a bushel of chilies and I was like what we're gonna what and of course now it's just it's fall that's what we do in the fall it's I love it and now we put up two bushels (laughs) that's a lot of green chilies it's a lot of chilies it's a lot of chilies yeah That's awesome. So now, like the title of the book implies, you know, most of the recipes in the book, of course, feature the green chilies. But I was really curious, are there specific varieties of peppers that are considered green chilies or is it any unripe pepper would qualify to be used? Um, No, not all chilies would be considered a green chili. These have been bred specifically for their thick walls. Like if you order um, in a Mexican restaurant, if you order a chili relleno, usually those are poblano chilies. And sometimes they would be the Anaheim's. Um, the hatch green chili is legendary. So it is an unripe chili. So to answer that question, yes. But it is specifically a chili that's been bred to be roasted, to be uh, stuffed, made into soups and stews. Um, the wall, you know, you want a good thick walled chili. So that's what they're bred for. Okay. Okay. I dig it. So we're thinking, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the peppers you name. Of course, like you said, the hatch is, is famous from New Mexico. So they're larger around so we can stuff them like a poblano. They got a thicker wall so they can handle roasting a little bit longer. So it is an unripe pepper, but there are specific varieties that are ideal for these roasted chilies that you're, you're talking about in the recipes. Exactly. So there's the Pueblo, there's the Big Jim, there's the Anaheim, the Hatch, um, just off the top of my head. I gotcha. Okay. So now I think, Annie, that we should play a game. I think we should do a quick round of chili pepper trivia. Uh, I'm going to test your knowledge. Uh-oh. Oh yeah. With some uh, chili pepper trivia questions. And yes, uh, in case you're wondering, I will be keeping score. So are you ready? <laughs> I am. I am. Fantastic. Okay, your first question. The heat in a spicy pepper is caused by the chemical capsaicin. Which animal is not affected by the spicy burn? Is it A, deer, B, cats and dogs, or C, birds? Birds. You're absolutely right. It's an interesting thing how birds um, are immune to capsaicin, and that's actually how peppers, um, domesticated peppers, were, were spread about. Well, wild peppers, which eventually became domesticated peppers, the birds would eat them and then they would disperse the seeds as they fly around. Well, that's just super cool. All right, here's your next question. So, so far you're one for one, so you're doing great. 
Okay. Fresh chili peppers are known by one name, but once they're dried and smoked, they're often referred to by a different name. So what do we call a dried and smoked jalapeno? Is it A, not a pino, B, chipotle, or C, serrano? So that is definitely a chipotle, which is one of my very favorite seasonings. Ah, so good. It's so good. And you're absolutely right. It's Chipotle. Um, But what I found out is that most Chipotle is actually made with the ripened red jalapenos. Um, That makes sense. I didn't know that, though. That's awesome. Cool. That's really cool. And here's your last chili pepper trivia question. And it is not a multiple choice. Ready? Uh Uh-oh. What popular and somewhat spicy rock and roll band was founded in 1983 in Los Angeles, California? Red Hot Chili Peppers. You got it. Awesome. (laughs) So you got your final score today is going to be three out of three, which means, Annie, that you are a chili pepper expert. Uh, Thanks for playing chili pepper trivia with us. It was so much fun. Warfano's Happy Heart, favorite green chili recipes and more is now available everywhere the books are sold. Where can folks find you online to stay in touch and order their copy of your new cookbook? Yeah, you can find me at highprairiepress.org. Excellent. I'm going to put all those links down in the show notes. And thank you again, Annie, for being our show today. It was a blast. It was great. It was so much fun. All right, that's a wrap, folks. Thanks again to Bree Arthur and Annie Tora Lopez for being on the show. You can find all of their links and many more down in the show notes and on our website, seedsandweedspodcast.com. If you'd like to support our program, well, we'll love you forever. That link, of course, is patreon.com slash smallhousefarm. This podcast is recorded and produced by all of us here at Small House Farm. The music you're listening to right now is A Little Ditty by Zahady. Thanks again for tuning in. I'm your host, Bevan Cohen, and we'll see you next time. 